Welcome back. We are now on our second session of the day. Uh, this is a different room than what we had there, but something common about these rooms is that this session will pick up from what Dr. Ramahopa spoke about and really talking about uh, the service delivery in the metros and, and cities that is as far as infrastructure is concerned. So we're going to have Nosi Poetla Joyo uh, from South African Cities Network uh, alongside her panel that will take us through to talk about uh, speaking some of the themes and issues arising from the keynote that we uh, listened to, in particular, infrastructure financing and delivery issues in local municipalities and introducing some additional uh, considerations. So Nosipo is with her panel and she'll do the wonders of taking through the session uh, with everyone else in the session. I'm not sure if Nosipo is here. Nosipo, can you hear me? Yes, Hi, I can Nosipo. hear you. Hi, I can hear you. Oh, you can hear me. All right, Nosipo, just to introduce you quickly, Nosipo is a business strategist with specialization in the public and private sector growth and sustainability. Uh, she has led uh, turnaround strategies for medium large organizations. She focuses on development implementation, critical evaluation, organizational policy, and strategy towards sustainable growth and development. I can tell you now that NOSIPO has an extensive network um, or a, an experience in public sector, including two large metro cities, as well as business, as, as a business acumen that has allowed her to transverse the public and the private sector domain. Nosipo, this is you uh, really getting into the stage. Thank you, and you may take it away. Good luck to you. Thank you so much. Um, we'll have our panel discussion, and um, my job is quite simple today. All that I'm meant to do is to facilitate, reacting obviously from what um, Dr. Jose Enzo Ramahopa shared with us uh, this morning, which was quite insightful. He took us um, back in history, uh, you know, when he spoke about the Marshall Plan and the Ross plan and what the Chinese are doing. Um, there was a bit nostalgic, almost took me to classroom, but he also then um, took those things and said, how do they relate to what South Africa is trying to do here? So in our presence, um, we've got our um, panel that is going to be um, joining us here today. And I must say that um, it's a panel of people that are very knowledgeable on the subject and they're going to offer um, quite useful insights um, on uh, what we are talking about today on infrastructure and service delivery in, in metropolitan municipalities and cities. First up, we've got um, Lisa Rose um, Sirolia from the African um, Center of Cities. Um, and you already do have her profile, but her work really focuses on the interface between the social, the political, um, technical and institutional dimensions of uh, urban infrastructure and uh, housing and human settlement. Um, then we also have uh, Mr. Letu Masango, who is with the World Bank um, and Urban Planner, and his work currently focuses on smart cities and is currently working with four metropolitan municipalities. And then lastly, on our panel, we have Mr. Jonathan First, who comes from the investment banking sector. Um, and his focus has been on climate finance and has also assisted in the establishment of the various financing um, structures and work with, and has worked with the DBSA as well in the establishment of the um, uh, climate finance uh, fund. So really looking forward to um, an, an, an interesting discussion um, here today and our reactions to um, what Dr. Ramokhopa has um, shared with us. Maybe first up, let me just start with you, um, Lisa. I do understand that you have a uh, something that you'd like to share with us. Um, maybe let's just give um, the opportunity to you to share your thoughts with us um, before we go to the rest of um, our panel members. Thank you, Nasipo. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. 
Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, and it is about one o'clock in the morning here. So I'm saying hi, uh, coming in from uh, California at the moment. Thank you so much for having me. I'm Liza Chirlia. I'm with the African Center for Cities. And my work um, focuses on questions of infrastructure governance and uh, urban statecraft. So my main focus is on the way in which infrastructure and the fiscal dynamics of cities shape uh, the way in which the state operates. So what I'm actually going to do in this in this few minutes that I have is actually pose a series of questions that I think are really important and which stem from uh, the earlier keynotes and the presentations yesterday. The first question that I think is really important for South African uh, municipalities and particularly metropolitan areas is what is the way in which we are thinking about infrastructure and service delivery linking together with the informal sector. So in this context where so much of service delivery is actually not being regulated, is being is done outside of the network services that we are, that the cities are operating with, what does this look like into the future? How do we bring this into and interoperate with the network as the informal sector? It's such an important way in which people access services. There's a whole lot of different players and power dynamics that sit within that. Simply wishing it away or imagining that it should exist in a vacuum is not possible. So we have to think about the next five, 10 years, how we think about interoperating between those systems. The next really important question that I think uh, tags also into this panel more firmly is the question of ICT and where we think about that within the infrastructure debates at the urban scale. So we know that we think about water, energy, elect uh, electricity, energy, uh, we think about sanitation, waste, but we very infrequently think about what the ICT infrastructure of cities must look like. And this is more than just thinking about the platforms, uh, for example, the digital platforms that many of us use. It's actually about thinking about the, the cables, the satellites, the data centers, which are enabling these systems. So when we start to talk about smart cities and we start to talk about digitization, do we, are we on the same page about what the investments look like to support these sorts of platformization, both for cities and for the people who want to use these networks? I think that there's a further question as we move towards digitization and also as we start to celebrate informality and, and distributed infrastructure in what happens when really important constituents start moving off the network. And a lot of my work looks at what is happening to fiscal systems as wealthier populations move off networks. So the ways in which, for example, the water crisis in the, in the Cape Town context uh, really meant that many uh, wealthier users left the network and were no longer paying tariffs for that water and the implications, the really negative implications that it had for, for the local government. So we have to start really thinking as as people start putting solar panels on their homes, as people start leaving uh, you know, networks becoming more resource efficient, do we have fiscal alternatives to plug those gaps? And what does it mean to allow individual households, particularly wealthier households, to exit this network system that requires cross-subsidization? The final question that I think really impacts us at the, at the metropolitan scale is what is happening on the sort of fringes of the metropolitan region? So how do we imagine metropolitan integration of city systems? Are, we obviously have done an incredible job in the South African context of merging uh, local governments so that we have these metropolitan regions that we can work across, but we still know that there are, are is migration to the fringes and that at those regions, we need to think about how we integrate people and economies into urban systems. So as metropolitan areas continue to grow, what is the sort of jurisdictions and territorializations which we need to support the infrastructure networks in those areas? So those would be some of the questions that I think the previous presentation really throws up, particularly from a scholarly perspective, but also from a practical perspective uh, that I would like to leave us with at this point. So thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa, for those um, uh, reflections. I, I think they tie in very well with um, what um, Dr. Ramakopa has shared with us. And perhaps um, to, to just take your key questions and link it up with our next uh, panelist, which is um, led to Masango. You raised a, a critical question around the ICT. Um, 
Mr. Masangoletu, your reactions to what Dr. Ramokhopa has shared with us today. Okay. Sorry, my, my, my buttons were disabled. Uh, I'm sure you can hear me now. Thank you so much, Nosipo, and good morning uh, to everyone on the platform. Um, yes, and, and, and thank you, Lisa, for those um, insights. Uh, as, as you rightfully say, Nosipo, they speak directly to, to the work that I happen to be leading uh, in the South African space with the four metros, um, Joburg, Etogini, Ekurulene and Tswane on uh, advancing smart city uh, innovations within South Africa and, and, and taking a particular stance on, on infrastructure. Uh, and, and obviously listening to uh, Dr. Ramakhopa or Prof. Ramakhopa this morning, um, it, it, there were a lot of areas that I um, uh, picked up in, in terms of the work that we're doing. Um, and, and one of them is surely the the lack of um, expenditure or uh, the gaps in, in in capital expenditure that we're seeing, uh, even with some of the um, metros uh, top what, the five metros uh, out of the eight that are not uh, fully spending on the capital budget and and his point about um, the impact on uh, livelihoods on the ground the impact on people's lived experience and what that really means um, for those individuals. And the work that we are doing is in partnership with the Development Bank of Southern Africa, the DBSA, um, where a number of these challenges that Dr. Amakhapa spoke to uh, have been outlined, including the issue of uh, the, the, the fragmented spatial legacies that linger um, the fragmented and, and, and different um, organizational cultures that uh, you find in the cities. And to Lisa's point, uh, uh, even talking about digital uh, technologies and how cities organize themselves, you find it to be very fragmented across uh, the different cities. Um, but one of them that uh, I'm sure we're all aware of when we talk about smart cities is, is obviously this piecemeal and fragmented approach to smart city initiatives. Um, and, and it's often been confused as, as a technology uh, drive to sort of have technology in place and you'll solve all of your problems, you'll solve your inequality, you'll solve your, your job issues, etc. And that really isn't the case. Uh, and so this work that we are uh, doing with the DBSA um, is, is trying to bring common set of solutions uh, amongst the four cities uh, from the basic understanding of what a smart city entails. Um, and just to share uh, with everyone um, two definitions for me that uh, make absolute sense. Uh, one from the International Organization for Standards, which defines uh, smart cities as those that improve sustainability and resilience, um, improving how it engages society uh, and how it uses data and integrated technologies. So you hear the technology element comes in at the end. It's, it's more about the sustainability and the impact that you make on people's lives more than anything, as Dr. Uh, Prof. Ramakhopa indicated earlier on. Um, and, and the British Standards Institute um, holds a similar view, uh, where it's more about integration of the physical and the human systems with the digital uh, and the built environment to deliver a sustainable uh, and inclusive future for, for a city citizens. Right. Um, and, 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 and so we've uh, defined the work that we're doing um, around three important areas and listening again to what came out yesterday from uh, the likes of Prof. Ivo around um, the fact that South Africa's challenges are not really money related. Again, as Dr. Ramakhopa indicated earlier on, uh, the fact that there's resources that go and spend. 
um, we are trying to infuse the whole value chain. So from thinking about the strategy uh, up until the actual implementation of uh, projects that are related to the smart city strategy. So within this, we are helping the cities to to prepare and, and, and have a very clear picture of what it means to have a smart city strategy, where we're helping them firstly define uh, uh, through various m measures and, 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 and components of, of the strategy, uh, define where they are and then define where they see themselves in the next 10 years. And then um, uh, another point that Dr. Ramachopo spoke to around uh, project planning is the next phase of this work where we're then saying to the cities, what does it take to implement uh, specific projects and see the smart city strategy actually come to life? And in that you're talking issues around governance, you relating to uh, institutional arrangements within the city, you're talking to implementation plans. What um, what do you need? What are the ingredients you need in order to make your uh, smart city strategy come to life? Um, it's it's the financing, the blended finance that um, uh, Dr. Ramachopo spoke to. Uh, what are the elements? Uh, who are the role players? The, the private sector. What are the instruments for bringing the private sector in? Um, and and I think the DBS has taken a very open um, approach to this. Firstly, by engaging the World Bank, uh, another DFI, to sort of say, let's let's partner together, bring in your expertise. Um, and and down the line, when we get to actual project implementation, uh, it is about talking to the cities to say, bring in the private sector, bring in uh, community networks that are important. And then the third uh, and, and final component of this work is around capacity, uh, capacity building and, and knowledge exchange, uh, which really acknowledges that cities don't know it all. We don't know it all. Um, the city of Joburg will not have all the answers just like Teguini will not have the answers, but when uh, we, we sort of think about our common challenges and uh, start thinking about common solutions, we learn a lot from each other. We learn from what we have done well, we learn what uh, we've made mistakes from. Uh, and, and we're also looking uh, globally, of course, because the World Bank has a, a global footprint of some global experts that we can bring in around a select number of sectors to be able to land this infrastructure solutions uh, tied to the smart cities. Let me park it there, and Nasipo, thank you. Thank you so much um, for, for sharing that with us, Leitu. Um, while we're still waiting for Jonathan to reconnect, um, there's been, uh, there's an acknowledgement of the role of um, ICT and embracing um, the idea of smart cities, um, even in the National uh, Infrastructure Plan, as Dr. Ramakopa has shared with us. And I see there's a couple of chats um, which are also saying that uh, we need to um, really embrace this concept. But there's uh, someone that says government should take a lead uh, or should um, enhance the appetite um, for, 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 for smart cities. Um, do you think that there is um, that appetite for, for smart cities? And if maybe one was to be direct, we're talking about infrastructure um, investment for growth here. Um, if there is that appetite um, from um, government, is it demonstrable in the way that they are rendering their services for one so that I as a private sector person will know that the government is also seeing the benefit of this. And, in, and if, if, if there isn't that, what could be some of the stumbling blocks that make um, such not to be taken up by government institutions? Great. Uh, thanks. Thanks for that, um, Nasip. I, I, I think there definitely is an appetite. Um, if you uh, cast your eye a few years back um, in, in the early 2000s, um, you would see that a lot of the, um, the, the metros and other municipalities have actually pursued 
the concept of smart cities. Um, what what I think was a, a, a challenge in the South African space is that a lot of these solutions were, were vendor driven. So ICT uh, companies or um, uh, data, uh, large multinationals um, selling off ideas to cities, um, which were specific technology solutions uh, to solve for one issue. And what you then have is, is certain cities locking themselves up with a particular service provider. And down the line, when they then think about, okay, great, and let's, let's expand this smart city concept further, let's, this digitization uh, that we're doing, um, let's say it was a, a, a smart water meter project, for instance, right? Or a billing um, solution that was sold to the city. When they then try and bring in all the other components, uh, to Lisa's point around the platform, you'd find that these cities were then challenged in that set, in that they couldn't uh, link these uh, different city services, and uh, you basically have cities then developing multiple digital solutions that don't speak to each other. Right, so the city tries to then have an app to help um, passengers using. Um, a bus service, for instance, and they can't link it to to the one that relates to the billing and so on, right? So, whilst there's been an appetite, um, I think um, the, the 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 new appetite that is emerging is one that is really a, a lot more progressive. It's one that mm -hmm. sees. Um, the platform advantages. It's one that sees the the value in bringing in the private sector. Um, it's 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 one that's actually seeing a lot more of. Uh, let let's bring in NGOs and and service uh, providers from young entrepreneurs, etc., who can hack and 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 bring some solutions to uh, many of the challenges that residents face. Um, at the city level. So whilst the appetite is there, though, I, I do think there's still a long way to go because I think it's it's been a very interesting conversation, even in the work that we're doing currently, um, making the cities realize that this is not about digital solutions. You first you have to start by understanding what what are you actually trying to solve for? What are the major pain points of city residents, what are the major pain points of yourselves as cities, uh, issues of interoperability, access to data, and I see some comments in the, in the chat already relating to this issue of data and the fact that it's never open enough for citizens to make use of um, for economic development, information purposes, and so on. Thank you so much. Uh, we've got Jonathan back. Um, Jonathan, I'd like to invite you into our conversation now. Um, you've had Professor Ramahupa speak, and he says a, a lot of things that we know and we've known for a while, and a lot of things that are going to require the public sector to change how it structures itself, number one, the focus, particularly the metropolitan municipalities. And you coming in from um, funding background, um, are there any reactions that you'd like to um, just share with us on what he has, um, he has given us? Later on, we will have you know, dive deep into some of the points that he has, he has raised, but your initial thoughts on what he has shared with us. Okay, well, thanks very much and thank you for the invitation. So I, I come from a funding background and that's both investment banking and development finance. And in fact, at the Development Bank of Southern Africa, I had enormous amount of involvement um, with the city support program through national treasury, I was on secondment there, but also worked in the municipal space and continue to work in the municipal space. But I really want to sort of paint the reality. And I think this is the big challenge that we face, is that if you look at the municipal sector as a whole, I think there's 257 municipalities. But what the, what the government has done is divided them into the metropolitan municipalities, of which there are eight, and then what they've called the intermediate cities, which are 39, and the rest of the so-called secondary cities. Now, the importance of that classification is that 
if you take the eight metropolitan municipalities and the 39 intermediate cities, they are responsible for about 75% of economic activity in the municipal space. So what the government is saying, or what National Treasury is saying, is if we, if we get them right, I'm not suggesting we ignore the rest, but if we get those right, we're going to make an enormous difference to the municipal space, to municipal infrastructure, to the, the communities that they serve. Mm -hmm. So that's the sort of good news from a focus point of view. The bad news is that we talk about bankable municipalities. So those are municipalities that can raise private sector funding. Because what we need to recognize is that the national treasury and the fiscus cannot solve the infrastructure funding challenge in this country. What it can do, people like the DBSA, or should I say organizations such the, as the DBSA, is they can catalyze or crowd in private sector, but they cannot solve for the infrastructure development and requirements in this country. And neither can we rely on the grant system that National Treasury has put in place to support municipalities. It's just not sustainable. So when we talk about a bankable municipality, as I said, it's those that can borrow money from the private sector. Now, unfortunately, and this is the bad news, I believe that only four of the eight metropolitan municipalities are bankable, and only 16 of the 39 intermediate cities are bankable. So the challenge is to get more of those municipalities bankable. Now, when we say bankable, there are two measures that we use. The one is the Auditor General's report, where we talk about unqualified um, reports. And the second is, as I said to you, the ability for that municipality to approach a bank, an impact investor, to issue a bond and to raise funding. And unfortunately, that's the reality. So we need to work with what we've got and you know once again this is i think dr ramachopa spoke about governance within the municipal space we've got to improve the financial credibility of the municipalities but unfortunately because we have a very decentralized um, um, government structure in other words there's a lot of power within the municipalities it's very much up to the municipalities to become financially responsible. I think the government, National Treasury, does an enormous amount of work to support this. But at the end of the day, given the way the constitution was, was set up, the power lies with the municipalities. And I think it's very much incumbent on the municipalities to become financially, financially or fiscally um, responsible. And I think once we achieve that, we will start to see a lot more infrastructure funding or a lot more availability of private sector funding for the municipal space. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Um, maybe just on the last point that you are raising, because you, you're quite correct, um, the bankability of a municipality and its ability to demonstrate that it manages its finances as well so that I, so that you as um, a, an investor or a funder would know that if you put money towards the projects of that municipality, you'd get it back. There's been in the past some who have called for, um, while we try to build um, the the financial credibility of municipalities others have said maybe um the national government much as the constitution gives these powers um to municipalities to sort themselves out others have said maybe national government can give guarantees um to metropolitan municipalities the same way that they do uh, with some of the parastatals. Um, any thoughts um, on that, particularly given the fact that we're saying we're trying to ensure that infrastructure investment takes place? Have we learned something from uh, where that has happened in the national sector? And would it be the advice that you give to National Treasury to go ahead on this path of giving guarantees for local municipalities or not? Well, so you raise two very interesting um, issues. The one is, if I am a municipality that have run, run my affairs properly, okay, and now you're going to prop up municipalities that haven't run their affairs properly, 
I think mm. you create a political issue. And it's this whole area around pooling. Remember that mm. pooling became a swear word because what was being suggested is that stronger municipalities support weaker municipalities, but the stronger municipality is going to be prejudiced in terms of the cost of their funding. You're creating a similar problem in the sense that it's an easy out for the, for the municipality that have not, um, not done well. I think that a better solution is somehow through the sort of grant system. And I'm not quite sure how, but in terms of the equitable grant and the conditional grants, maybe these can be tightened up in the way that they're provided. Maybe there can be more um, oversight um, or responsibility around this grant funding. But you know, you, you raise a very, very difficult, um, uh, a very difficult challenge that 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 the government faces. Is you know, on the one side there is you know the radical side of taking over the municipality, which I, as we know they're reluctant to do. The other one is to work within the existing, um, you know, regulatory or, or legal framework. So I don't think it's an easy solution, to be honest. Yeah, very true. I'm going. I'm going to come back to you, um, Jonathan, because um, there's a sense that there's money. Dr. Ramuhopa says there is money, and from what you are telling us, there is money. Uh, but there are some governance issues that need to be um, resolved um, by municipalities. Um, later on, we'll talk about the confidence that the private sector has on, um, uh, you know, um, the, 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 the municipalities in particular um, when it comes to giving them money. But I will go back to you, um, Liza. There were some very interesting points that you raised um, around the interface between um, the private and the informal sectors um, we've already uh, spoken about the about the about, about the ICT um, my question directed at you is what do you think is the role of partnerships in all of this so when we start bringing the various sectors into the conversation of infrastructure um, infrastructure e investment what should be the role of partnerships if we recognize that cities can't do it or municipalities can't do it on their own? Thank you so much. That's a really great question. And I think it's one of the questions that we ask ourselves frequently because we often think that partnerships are just uh, arrangements that exist for example, between public and private sector, right? And I think we're in this kind of moment of imagining partnerships to be much more widely conceptualized. So what would it mean, for example, for there to be a partnership between local government and community-based organizations to deliver on key service delivery mandates? What would the financial arrangements be? And even more importantly, what would the regulatory arrangements be to enable that? I think that there is there are quite a lot of challenges within the current uh, MFMA around how different partnerships for municipal infrastructure and particular service delivery can operate. And this is for many good reasons, because we need to regulate these things. We can't have all sorts of arrangements that are sitting outside of what the state can and should be understanding. At the same time, we already know that these service delivery systems are in operation in reality. So we already know that these systems exist and that people are using them. The question that I often ask is not only what do we do in terms of creating partnerships for for future service delivery, but how do we reconfigure the institutional arrangements for the services that are already being delivered mm -hmm. through these partnerships? And I think that South Africa has taken huge amounts of strides, for example, in the way in which negotiations with minibus taxi industries have operated. We know that in other parts of the continent, there's also been a lot of negotiation and partnerships that have been built with other forms of paratransit, motorbike, taxis, tuk-tuks. So we know that in the mobility sector, we already have some precedents set for how we create partnerships that are not just between the conventional private sector, but in fact, between much more complex actors within the private sector who may be sitting on the fringes of the regulatory environments. 
when we start to expand that to spaces like uh, water vendors or septic tank providers or other forms of, forms of hybrid infrastructure or heterogeneous is often a word that's used, heterogeneous infrastructure, I, I think we get a little bit more confused about what those partnerships should look like. Should the state be regulating? Should the state be subsidizing? Should the state be itself delivering and then allowing for a pri private sector or informal sector to be managing and maintaining? What are the different roles in service delivery and who holds the ultimate responsibility and finally really the risks uh, that come about when you start to think about fragmenting or diversifying infrastructure networks and not just in reality which already exists but actually then rubber stamping it by saying this is something that the state is actually agreeing with and in fact supporting so i think yes you're completely right partnerships need to be developed but the negotiation around those partnerships is is going to be much more interesting and dynamic when we step outside of conventional public-private partnerships and start thinking about, you know, existing informal networks, community-based networks, who is going to broker those partnerships? Do we have the skills within local governments to uh, craft and manage, maintain, support those sorts of partnerships over time? Thanks, Lisa. And when when you, you we're talking about these um partnerships i mean i'm i'm thinking about the the parting shots of um professor ramoho baun we were talking about um um what do they call them the construction mafias right because um he 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 says that some of these are uh, very legitimate uh, complaints that are coming from the informal construction sector um, about them not being included into the infrastructure investment investment pro investment projects, um, and yet when we conceptualize these projects and even through the procurement processes of municipalities, the assumption is always that the actors are only coming from um, the, the, the private sector. And that is why there's a formality um, in, in which you put together a document, you submit your documents and what is required in, in, in that documentation. Just touching on um, the, the informal sector and the private sector, is there a role that the private sector can play to make sure that while we talk about inclusive growth, um, it's not just something that the public sector or municipalities are talking about in bringing these in to avert what we have seen when projects get hijacked or they cannot continue because others feel that they are excluded? Yeah, that's a fantastic point, and I think really, really important because when we when we talk about the concept of the informal sector at all, it's a blurry boundary, right? And there's lots of informality or illegality and corruption and whatnot that exists even in in the in the so-called formal uh, private sector. Um, uh, it's not just something that is existing in the sort of small-scale uh, SME space. I also think that there's been a lot of interesting work that South African metropolitan areas have done to try to think about how to get the private sector and the public sector to engage more closely with small scale businesses and to be able to bring them into their service delivery networks. I know that Josie at Work program, which was very short lived <laughs> and in fact never truly came to uh, fruition, was a really brilliant example of trying to think seriously about this. The construction mafias and the sort of tender mafias at large, the entire construction sector, we know this in the South African context, is radically inflated. Um, it is, you know, these projects come in at far more than they should, and there is not the competition that we should be seeing in this sector. We also know that in certain components of this sector, the margins are actually quite small, and it's very difficult for the layman to make sense of where it's being inflated and where we're actually seeing uh, actually a much more difficult market. This is why I think this is such an important course is because we actually need to have a much stronger vocabulary collectively to make sense of what the private sector is doing. And from a public sector perspective, this is particularly important because this deal making capacity that the public sector is going to have to have as we step into the PPPs is going to require a savviness about the way in which the private sector operates that may or may not currently exist. So beyond just the sort of KPIs and the filling out compliance forms and these sorts of things, we need people in municipalities that know how to make sense of the interworkings of deal structures with the private sector. And this means being able to see when it's a construction mafia at work, being able to see when the project is radically inflated, being able to make sure that the public sector doesn't take on all the risk and the private sector all the benefit or the reward. We need to have 
really economically savvy people in the public sector domain, because as the P, uh, the sort of PPPs are forming, there needs to be a lot of cognizance to where and how risk is being allocated and to mm-hmm. understanding how the industries work. Um, so this is, again, yeah, I guess really why this is such an important program. Hmm. Th- thanks, Lisa. Uh, we, will, uh, we will come back to you um, as we are continuing with this discussion, uh, because at the end of the day, it's about tapping into that latent um, economic growth um, that we've spoken about um, this, mo- this morning. I- I'll come back to you. Um, uh, let me go back to you, um, Jonathan. Uh, Lisa, Lisa has given us her reaction around partnership between the uh, private sector and um, the, inform- the informal sector. Um, do you think that some of the instabilities um, in, in society, let me just call them that, which seems to be pocketed um, in certain areas might be a hinder um, in accessing some of this infrastructure infrastructure investment. Are we seeing that, or um, maybe to ask a, a question uh, differently? So the social um, conditions in the in in the municipality, which may mean that even if you put your money forward, projects might be uh, disturbed. Is that a factor that investors look into? And what role do politics? play in ensuring that there's confidence that is built in, in into the private sector to allow them to say yes we'll put our money we'll put our money forward so look politics is definitely most important and i think one of the Um, Jonathan, we seem to be um, losing you. I think it's uh, connectivity issues. While you try to, Jonathan, can you hear us? Okay. Maybe while Jonathan is uh, still trying to uh, reconnect, um, let me um, go to you, uh, Letu. Uh, Yes, smart cities. And um, we all want these things to happen. Um, And we talk about your basic services. Um, It was water, um, electricity, um, freight, and then then smart cities. At the end of the day, these things should support social, social development, right? And these things happen in space. And we're talking about municipalities and infrastructure investment on projects that happen in municipality, there's also an element that is done by other spheres of government. Is there integration? If the the national infrastructure plan is aiming to get us to a particular point when it comes to um, investment and contributing to the economy, are the plans at the various spheres of government allow, aligned to allow us to do this? And, and um, I do acknowledge your role now in, um, a, a, um, a, in the World Bank, but talk to us through your previous experiences as well and how this might um, um, hinder what we're trying to, to achieve with the, with the very ambitious targets of the National Development Plan and the National Infrastructure Plan. Yes. Um, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for taking me back, uh, Nosipo, uh, reminding me that I'm a planner um, first and foremost. Um, it, it, yeah. Indeed. Uh, I think it's it's forever been a very difficult space. Um, the integration of different um, uh, spheres of government, um, even even across, um, so horizontally, seeing it uh, with 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 different. Uh, municipalities and and just maybe a couple of examples where this fragmentation seems to still be an issue. Um, uh, take take BRT um, and the the work that's um, gone on in different municipalities within the Gauteng uh, city region, and you will find that. Um, somebody residing in Pretoria or in, in Tembisa 
when when they have to take that public transport into the city of Joburg um, cannot do that in a seamless manner. Uh, they are still confronted with having to get off at a particular station um, probably in some instances walk several uh, kilometers to, to the next station. If not, they'd have to take a taxi and then they'd have to use a very different system to, to get on to the uh, other cities' uh, bus rapid transit. Um, and, and so that, 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 that fragmentation is so palpable even at a um, city level. And, 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 and you think that it wouldn't be the case in, in a place like uh, the Gauteng city region, which is an agglomeration. There's so many people who live in, in the deep south, in Val and work in Pretoria, but the, the systems just don't work for them. Um, and, and the same can be said about um, the the different sectors that that you you come across. And again, I'll I'll, I'll reflect on my experience in the city of Joburg um, with with the human settlements. And I know that the conversation has moved on where there's a lot more integration between, uh, or supposed to be a lot more integration between the different spheres, but. One of the major challenges that we had was just aligning the different um, spheres of government from province to the city to understand where the city was going um, with, with its housing program or human settlements program. And on the other hand, having to contend with, with, with the province, which seemed to have a lot more of a a numbers-driven program, right? So whilst we're still thinking through how to create really sustainable human settlements that actually support the people that uh, will be housed in a particular space, um, you then finally find uh, uh, the province having approved and started developing uh, a, a housing project outside of the urban boundary with no access to schools, no access to um, health facilities. And only then the, the, the city would then have to react um, and, and call on different um, uh, entities of, of government. So the education department calling on province, etc. Um, and, and you see the same uh, impact in areas such as the West Rand of the city of Joburg, where you've got this huge agglomeration of um, townhouses, which are, are not supported by public um, uh, schooling, health uh, facilities, etc. So I really think that the, there really is a long way to go. And part of the thinking around the smart city work and, and what... Uh, uh, the president is uh, pronounced around um, Lancera was was thinking in this big fashion around how do you create a a sustainable um, uh, a city that 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 is an example of what um, ought to be done moving forward. I'm I'm not going to get into too much on that whether I believe yes or no, uh, but um, I think there are many instances where. Uh, the smart city agenda is actually a, a, an enabler can actually help us think through so many of these issues around um, uh, ensuring that the, there's, there's, there's clarity of who the end beneficiaries are. There's an integrated approach to um, uh, service delivery and the fact that uh, you just have so many considerations while you're planning for a human settlements uh, intervention. And it's not just about housing uh, as an end goal. When you think of uh, waste management, you, you have to think of it um, in line with environmental considerations, et cetera. You know? So mm -hmm. I, 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 I think there is a long way to go just to make sure that the, um, we're all gelling uh, mm -hmm. across the different spheres of government. Certainly. And if this investment is meant to reach a particular outcome, be it economic or social, if it happens um, in a disintegrated way, then it's not going to assist us. Thank you, Leti, for that. Jonathan, let's go back to you. Um, we, we had, um, I posed a question around um, uh, the confidence. 
um, uh, you know, um, that investors have on the um, public sector and um, the politics, how, how much role. So clearly nationally, there's been these pron pronouncements and national government is very strong. Um, they've come strong and they're clear on what they want um, uh, this national infrastructure plan to do, which then filters into the, into the cities. Um, is it just the rhetoric? I mean, from the, those that fund it, is there confidence that these things will actually be done or actually can be done? Um, well, first of all, apologies. Um, I lost connectivity. So clearly Cape Town is not a smart city yet. So it has to work on it. But it, apologies that I'm going to keep my camera off. So absolutely, politics is fundamental to private sector funding. Um, and as I said to you, I was about to say, unfortunately, the democratic process does not support political stability because we work in four to five years. So always the argument is the bureaucrats are there you know, forever, but the politicians are there temporarily. So it does pose a problem that we're having to look at new, new political parties possibly every four to five years. But I think having said that, I think if the, let's call it the bureaucratic side, the bureaucrats, the people that actually run the municipalities, the municipal managers, the financial directors, you know, if they're good, they will survive political change, I believe. Maybe not the municipal manager, but certainly the people below them. So I think you can create sufficient, let's call it stability, management stability within the municipalities for the private sector to continue to support those municipalities. Um, so I think, yeah, I think politics is important, but I think it's possible. I think what's going to be much more interesting is that and, and I'm, I'm getting here to probably a little bit an area that's slightly controversial is we perhaps have to in South Africa, we perhaps have to look in the future at coalition politics, which is something we're not used to. So coalitions can work. Absolutely. They can bring stability to municipalities, but they could have the opposite effect. So I think these are, you know, these are considerations that we have to look at um, as we sort of move forward in terms of munis municipal infrastructure, the development of municipal infrastructure and of course the way that private sector can support um, the development of, of, of infrastructure within the municipal space thank you thanks Th thank you thank you jonathan and this talks to the um capacity and capability because um earlier on uh we had spoken about the need for building skills in in, in municipality while, while you're still um um, in, in the platform, uh, Jonathan. So we spoke about the need to build skills in municipalities. And then the political discussion seeks to bring in an element of capability. Do the conditions in, in your space allow for delivery to take place and for continuity um, of, of certain infrastructure plans um, to, to see their intended life? Just looking at uh, building skills. So um, earlier on, we had spoken about a need for building the pipeline. So there's um, arguments that says we do have skills um, in municipalities. Uh, we do have people that can do these things, but something is just not right. Uh, in your experience, um, do we have skills um, uh, or is it an issue of prof professionalization? If there's anything that you would say needs to be done, at least in the municipal space, to unlock this um, projects that don't get delivered and therefore monies get returned to um, uh, 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 national treasury because projects were not completed or infrastructure maintenance plans could not be implemented, what would be your advice? So, I, once again, I mean, this is there's a lot of issues here. So. The first is I want to talk about pipeline itself, so the projects themselves. And we talk about this um, feasibility to bankability. And I think it's very, very important to understand that. So in sustainable funding or impact funding, which is where we're all moving, in other words, the funders are moving, the concessional funders, um, <clears throat> we talk about bankable projects. So whether you're a DFI, a DBSA, or whether you're a private sector impact fund or bank, you'll want to see bank projects in what we call a bankable form. And that means they can make an investment decision based on the project. So this is not necessarily a skills 
issue. It's an understanding issue. So, for example, a technical report is not a bankable project. A technical report is one aspect of a bankable project. It has it goes far beyond that. It goes around a financial model. It goes around social and economic report. It goes around in, environmental report. It's putting all of that together to present a bankable project in which a, an investor across the board can make a decision. So that's, that, is, that is often a misunderstanding. It's not necessarily a capacity thing. Having said that, and, and, and this is why it's a difficult conversation, there are some municipalities that are very good at putting these bankable projects together. In other words, they have the, let's call it the capacity to do so. And there are others that don't. So I think once again, the challenge, if you talk about capacity building within the municipality, is the ability to take projects, catalytic projects, and move them from feasibility to bankability, which is two things. It's a, a financial resource, okay, because you know often you need to employ consultants to do, do a lot of the reports, but also it's a non-financial resource. In other words, having people within the municipality with the capacity or the ability to do so. And I think mm -hmm. that's where uh, you know, going back to what Dr. Ramachopal was referring to, I think that's where the challenges and the opportunity is to get people back into the municipal, into municipalities, into the municipal space to help with this, this capacity, this capacity requirement to move projects from feasibility to bankability. And, and I think that's really where both the challenge is, but also the answer to the, develop, to the development of infrastructure in the municipal space. Thanks. Uh, quite useful feedback there. So the difference between the feasibility and the bankability. And I suppose what you're saying is even how municipalities then assemble these teams that work on these things. It can't just be seen as something that the infrastructure project is working on, but they need to look broader at the pool talent that they have, who are the right people to be brought into this pro into this um, uh, particular project to make it um, bankable. Uh, the, and that's where the issues of bankability, which I know that colleagues at National Treasury, uh, transversality, colleagues at National Treasury are very much uh, fascinated about. Thank you for that. Um, Eliza, I'm, I'm going to come back to you. Um, now, um, looking at the chats and some of the comments that have been um, shared uh, by some of the participants, there's a chat that came from uh, Naledi May, and she was talking about well-managed finances. She says that well-managed finances is, a very is very delicate since most of the time municipalities who are struggling to manage their finances require assistance with infrastructure development. And she's asking what could be the possible solution. Any thoughts on that? <laughs> Sure, sure. That's uh, it's an interesting question. I actually think there's probably uh, better people on the panel to be talking about municipal um, municipal finance than myself. Uh, but what I would say is that, and I only work on larger metropolitan areas, so I don't work on uh, smaller municipalities. And of course, the larger metropolitan areas have a whole range of of grants and whatnot that are more available to them. The first thing that I would say is that I think that the question of land is really central to this conversation. And this is this goes beyond how municipalities leverage uh, property tax, but has to go into questions of how they buy bank uh, and um, pool land uh, for their own municipal planning processes. So one of the really important questions around land-based financing or land value capture is, is how uh, particularly metropolitan municipalities are going to think much more creatively about the assets that fall within their domain uh, and the regulatory environments that uh, allow or disallow for different kinds of value capture within that. Um, and, you know, it's it's always been an interesting uh, question for me because, you know, many people have said, you know, local government, they don't understand land value capture, they don't understand how to land bank, but everybody inherently understands the value of land and individuals certainly understand what it means for uh, their own 
personal planning to buy or store land in particularly, uh, you know, areas of cities that are going to be developed over the next uh, five to 10 years. So the fact that city governments don't seem to be able to plan in that way when we know intuitively that each individual working in the government and in fact understands this concept, I've always found to be a quite interesting. I think that uh, particularly for the metropolitan areas, we're going to be experiencing further challenges uh, as we look towards uh, particularly a decentralized infrastructure. And I have said this before, that as uh, particularly wealthier households exit the grid, we're actually going to be experiencing even more fiscal deficits. The national treasury has to consider what they're going to do uh, to supplement those in the form of grants. At the moment, what we see is a plethora of conditional grants which is really interesting because these conditional grants, of course, allocate more uh, uh, revenue or income for local governments, but at the same time, create lots of rules and regulations around how that can be spent. Mm -hmm. So instead of being directly accountable to their constituencies and the needs and desires of their constituencies, uh, these local governments are setting up all sorts of special reporting metrics and units to speak to the treasury itself. And that kind of tension between being accountable to national treasury and being accountable to citizens is, is I'm sure, Matt, I'm sure would have mentioned this, is a, is a huge tension. So I think that many of the tools we've been trying to use to support local government have come with lots of strings attached. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm a big proponent of local government revenue generation wherever we can, and particularly leveraging resources like land. At the same time, we need to think about transfers and how we maintain accountability on those transfers without over-circumscribing and over compliancing those instruments. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, maybe just a, a follow up on this one, and we will still explore this um, a little bit. And maybe I'll throw it at Jonathan um, around um, lacking finances and um, being those municipalities being in dire need for um, infrastructure investment. Uh, Lisa, on your um, contribution, the last thing you're talking about, you're talking about the balance. Um, and yes, um, these investments, as much as they are meant to, um, help us grow the economy. At the same time, they need to support um, uh, social development. So the the, the well being, um, navigating this balance. When I live in an area and I know that we don't have some of the basic services, and making sure. Um, being maybe the accounting officer in the municipality, knowing that we need to invest in infra in economic uh, generating um, infrastructure. What do you think should be some of the considerations um, by the officials in the cities when they do these trade-offs and maybe by the residents themselves, um, acknowledging the fact that the two need to go hand in hand? What came first? What should come first? Um, so I think what's most important to consider first and foremost is that we need to think about service provision First and foremost, this is an absolute question of fundamental dignity, and it is not possible or or um, in any way beneficial to consider sort of questions of economic growth in the absence of of human dignity. At the same time, uh, the question of jobs is fundamental to the question of human dignity. Mm. And if we are considering what it means to create particularly low-skilled and semi-skilled jobs, we have to consider that as part of the fundamental package for dignity, mm. for aspiration, for growth, for people to survive in cities. And uh, many meaningful and long-lasting jobs as possible and we need to think about what the people who are going to be undertaking these jobs what that means for them to live in a dignified way in cities so mm -hmm. that that trade-off for me is is more important than the economic growth trade-off um, and I know a lot of people uh, are on the fence about capital uh, versus labor ratios when we come to speaking about infrastructure investment but I would generally push very hard for saying in all of our investments, we have to think about meaningful work. Um, that's there's no there's really for the South African context with the with the, the coal transition. These are fundamental questions for for urban governments to be thinking about, and incredibly dangerous and risky not to be taking seriously. Great. So it's not really a matter of whether you are left aligned or right aligned. It's really about what is just, and making sure that when we invest. Um, 
at the end of the day, it is about for the benefit of the people and those benefits, others then become um, the byproducts um, of that. Let's go back to you, Jonathan, um, on the question around um, uh, finance, finances, management of finances in municipalities. And the comment was saying, usually it's those municipalities that can not manage their finances um, that are, really need infrastructure investment. What then happens? Do we do we leave them or sh should there be a separate model that is proposed to make sure that infrastructure happens there? We release them of a responsibility of infrastructure investment and they just sort out their house. What could be the solutions around this one? Um, big sigh there. Um, right. So I just want to put some context first before I answer that question. So mm. South Africa as a developing country has probably the deepest debt capital markets in the world. There is about six or seven trillion rand available to be invested in the, in, in, in the country. Now, very little of that is currently invested in infrastructure, be that private or public sector infrastructure. So we certainly have the deep enough pockets to support infrastructure development, be it at a, at a, at a government level, or at a municipal level. So I think that's very important to understand that money is available. This is not this is not a shortage of money. It's a shortage, as I think you said, of an enabling environment in which to invest that money. As far as the municipality is concerned, I mean, once again, I think, you know, those municipalities that are in dire straits, in other words, they're not going to recover because of legacy issues. Perhaps we need to treat them like a company that's gone into business rescue. Maybe we need to go in and restructure everything about that municipality. In other words, treat it as a restructuring, which includes um, the people within the municipality, the management within the municipality, but of course, the, the funding, the finances of the municipality, and then start afresh. So it's done in the private sector. Um, you know, people accept it's not it's not ideal. People lose money, but maybe that's what maybe that is a solution, is to treat this like a workout, as you would if a company in the private sector went into into difficulty. But I think what's most important, if you go down that route, you must put in place <clears throat> the 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 barriers, or should I say, to prevent it happening again. That is what's most important. Because I think if, if funders can see that, they will accept a municipality being restructured. But what's most important to them from a funding point of view is that, is that it's unlikely to happen again. Mm -hmm. So I think, yeah, maybe that is the solution. Maybe is to, to go into those municipalities and maybe to look at some form of restructuring plan. Mm. Yeah, quite quite radical. And I suppose that we need to look at all um, alternatives available to us because it is a fact that there are municipalities that just will not be able to deliver um, um, this kind of infrastructure and they're also str struggling um, um, uh, financially. Um, Lisa and Colin, um, thinking about this question, I mean, Lisa, you've given us your thoughts. Colin, any thoughts on this? Yes, uh, th th thanks, uh, Nosipo. So, um, I, I was, I was uh, jotting down as Jonathan was talking um, about this point of uh, almost putting uh, these different cities uh, or considering them as an entity that needs to, um, that has gone under administration, right? But we have a, a similar system uh, in terms of being able to place um, and municipalities that aren't performing under administration. But I think uh, maybe what Jonathan is alluding to is that the, the instruments that are being used are actually not sufficient to, to be able to realize um, the turnaround that's desired with uh, each of those uh, municipalities that are placed under administration. And I think 
Um, you know, one, one of the areas that uh, we have uh, been particularly involved in um, with uh, COCTA some two years back was in designing an intermediary city support program, um, which uh, looked at um, those municipalities in a lot more holistic manner. So um, in terms of uh, addressing capacity, building uh, constraints. Um, uh, there was a component that looked at performance linked, linked technical assistance, um, mm. as well as uh, uh, obviously the implementation of performance-based uh, municipal grants, right? And 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 I think, you know, there's um, it warrants for uh, a deeper conversation of what really can be done some more, you know, from, from, from that uh, exercise that we undertook, we realized that uh, the cities had do, um, benefited a lot from uh, the, the municipal governance uh, principles, uh, thinking a lot more uh, creatively around um, spatial development frameworks. And somebody had raised the question earlier on about Splume and, and its effectiveness. Um, those municipalities uh, benefited from being able to expend a lot more uh, on, on their capital uh, capital budgets through the capital expenditure framework that was designed as well. Um, and also around um, just the execution of budget um, that's been uh, allocated to the municipalities. I do think that a lot uh, more can be done, obviously, to to help uh, municipalities that are struggling. W one other point that I'd, I'd, I'd like to just weigh in as well on Nosipo is just this issue around uh, the involvement of the private sector and, and, and breaking down this cake whenever um, government uh, uh, spends or has a, a budget to spend. Um, and it's similar to something that uh, uh, Dr. Ramachopa raised as well um, around the, the, the true impact of, of infrastructure, financing and development, is this concept of um, creative procurement as, as an instrument to really challenge and push municipalities to, to think a lot more creatively about what can be done within the confines of, of the MFMA. Uh, Lisa made the point as well that um, you've got the, uh, a great example in the Josie at Works program, which was short lived but had all the good intentions, had gone through national treasury regulations, and was a, actually a, an instrument to be able to break down um, uh, government expenditure so that a lot more people are able to derive a benefit from it, right? Um, and, and I think those are areas that we really need to explore a lot more uh, vigorously as, as, as we move ahead to be able to challenge the MFMA and if there are parts of it that need to be done away with so that we, we open up the pie or uh, yeah, cut up the pie into many, many smaller pieces so that entrepreneurs, uh, small businesses can benefit. I really think it, it's an, an important area as we converse on infrastructure. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I'm looking at the time and I'm appreciating the chats that um, um, have been shared with us and the responses of our um, panelists. Um, but I think we do need to wrap up this conversation. Um, there's a whole lot that has been said and the insights that you have shared with us in uh, reacting to what uh, Professor Ramokhopa has um, uh, um, uh, given us this morning, it has uh, been um, absolutely uh, very informative, um, at least for me, and I'm, I'm sure that for the attendants as well. Um, in concluding um, this discussion, I'm just going to ask three questions, and I'm, I'm hoping that in your concluding remarks as well, you would um, consider them. So the first one is talking about, uh, relates to um, these plans that we have. And maybe, Lisa, if I were to direct this one, they're called national plans. Yes, we were talking about the National Infrastructure Plan. We're talking about the National Development Plan. And they set out ambitious um, targets uh, for the country. What needs to be done? 
for these to really be national plans and not government plans, for everyone to own them from the private sector to say, yes, understand that I've got a role to play. And for them, not, not just as a rhetoric, for them to see that there's something that they can do, whether they're coming from the formal or the informal sector, whether they are government or the private sector, um, that's that's one thing that we need to um, think about. So I'd like for you to touch on that. Uh, maybe directed at you, Leto, um, as part of your parting short, um, when we talk about smart cities, um, what um, uh, capabilities still need to be developed in the cities uh, or in municipalities um, across to make sure that this investment, infrastructure investment that needs to take place um, is, actually, is actually realized and that it supports um, uh, service delivery and it support it supports growth and then lastly to you Jonathan if you can just help us by giving us some of the pointers yes we're talking about um, a need for bankable um, uh, projects um, and um, feasibility but what other support mechanisms that we all need to think about to make sure that we get out of the current situation that the realization of closing that um, was it 4 trillion or 40 trillion rand um, um, uh, that uh, Dr. Ramukhoba was talking about, 4.8 trillion gap of infrastructure investment? What else should we consider? So uh, I'll give you an opportunity to give us your um, um, parting uh, remarks, um, maybe starting with you, um, um, Lisa. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, so the question that you asked me, I think, is a really interesting one, and it is, uh, how do we ensure that the national plans become all of society plans and not just government plans, right? And I think this is a really interesting question because I'm trained as a city planner and I've always had to ask myself, can the government expect other actors to be enrolled in plans that are designed and constructed in through, through government processes, right? Can you ask the private sector specifically to invest in something that is not their mandate necessarily? Um, and definitely they don't have accountability to the people and the constituents for. And what always comes back to me is that we have no option. We have no option but to uh, imagine that these plans become coordinating instruments. But we have to think much more clearly about what the roles um, and the tools that the plan engenders for coordination actually are. Because drawing a line on a map and saying this is where the private sector must invest its, uh, you know, power production uh, capacity, this may or may not be a site that, that a private sector operator wants to invest in, owns, uh, sees as financially viable, etc. So what are the actual tools that exist within the planning frameworks that are not just drawing pretty things on maps and saying this is what different actors should do who are not in fact complied um, or required to do those things, what are the actual regulatory uh, or um, stimulating tools that can be used to encourage and shape where and how investment flows? That's very different than imagining that you're somehow going to get collective buy-in from a group of what is actually quite fragmented stakeholders across an open system. That is my closing remark. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, uh, Liza. Um, Letu, over to you. Thanks, thanks, Nasipo. So, um, you know, in, 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 in just thinking about uh, the whole concept of smart cities uh, and, and reflecting on work that was done in 2019 by uh, Roland Berger on Smart City Index, it, it said that the over 250 cities uh, had smart city strategy documents, right? Um, of those, 153 were published and only eight were were implemented right uh, and that is pretty much the same issue that we face in in south africa it's about translating whatever we have as great ideas into actual uh, implementation and you know in 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 thinking about some of the gaps that uh, really need to be filled in terms of capacity building it really is on issues of uh, city governance and leadership. It's on collaboration amongst uh, different entities of um, government and across uh, city uh, leadership. Uh, it's it's a it's bridging the administration silos and it's the ability to engage citizens. Right now, those are all not 
um, fancy technical uh, challenges. They're all about how we actually relate to one another. And um, again, it's back to this point of what are we trying to solve for? I think the more um, we get departments to think about whom are you solving for, it is the person who's suffering from lack of infrastructure spend, etc. Those are all the individuals that um, need to be at the forefront and all the solutions then uh, would, would, would come about a little bit easier. Thank you very much, Nasiba. Thank you so much, uh, Letu. Thank you for that. Um, Jonathan, your concluding remarks, please. Yeah, so um, Dr. Ramakhopa, um, there was an article, I think, in the Sunday Times last, last, last week. He spoke about the gap that's required between now and 2030 for infrastructure um, development and delivery in the, in the municipal space. And, you know, he, he's convinced, and I likewise am convinced, that this can be funded by the private sector. But you've got to be able to give them the environment in which to invest. And that I see on a sort of macro level and a micro level. So the macro level is regulatory reform. In other words, government has got to take leadership um, in this regard. And, and I think they're starting to do that. So that's the sort of regulatory environment that's required from government. The second part is, of course, the micro environment. And that's the municipalities themselves taking responsibility. Now, obviously, government can play a role there, as Colin mentioned. But I think it's also incumbent upon the municipalities to become far more responsible in fiscal management, in, in, in the way they manage the municipalities, et cetera. And I have, I have no doubt that should we achieve that, and yes, we've got a long way to go, you will start to see private sector investment in infrastructure in the municipalities at scale. The other thing that's very important is that the fiscus and, the, and, and money provided from, from national treasury through the grant program and money from the development banks needs to be seen as a catalyst for this private sector. Okay, not a sort of, not an end in, its, in itself. And this goes back to the principles of blended finance and what development finance is all about. It's not going to be solved through public finance and development finance, the, the infrastructure development in the private sector. It's only going to be solved by bringing in private sector investment, and that can be supported by um, government government funding and, of course, development finance funding. So if, this is not mission impossible, but I think there has to be m enormous changes within the municipal space and the way the municipalities govern themselves for this to take place. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, panelists, thanks for your time um, and for your reactions to um, the very um, exciting um, input that we got from uh, Professor Ramahopa this morning. Obviously, um, we've um, gathered a lot of insight um, based on your experience and how you've interacted um, uh, this morning. Certainly, I um, walk out of the session a better person than I was when I entered it. Out of this, um, I've recognized um, the fact that financing is not just a matter about money, but it's also being financing for infrastructure rather it's not just about money but it's also being about putting a compelling case on why you should be financed and there are systemic issues that um, these institutions public institutions need to deal with if they are ever to be able to um, um, crack this um, issue of infrastructure investment um, this is the end and then i'll hand over to you facilitator Vus. Oh, we oh, lost Nosipo. No no right, right there, we have that was Nosipo. No Thank you so much to you, Nosipo, and your team, Colin, or rather Letu, Liza, and Jonathan, all joining us online. And we're still here at the Visual Production Studios. And we can't thank enough um, Dr. Ramakhopa 
for that an overarching presentation that set the ground for what we just listened to from our panel of experts. Um, thank you so much to all the participants that were part of this session and really contributed and asked very good questions to our panelists. Uh, yeah, the poll is up, so you could uh, go and complete the survey of the poll and get a sense, give us a sense of how you thought about the poll. Um, so we could be able to improve as we proceed in the 2022 winter school. Remember, we are still live on social media with the hashtag GTEC Winter School 2022. That's GTEC Winter School 2022. And just to read one of the tweets there from uh, Nokolo Kabane, uh, you can follow her at Nox Kabane. And she says, interesting discussions underway at the GTEC Winter School 2022, reflections on how partnerships are conceptualized, negotiated, and managed in infrastructure and service delivery in metros and, of course, cities. Thank you so much, Notolo. You too can join Notolo and follow the conversation with hashtag GTEC Winter School 2022. For more resources, go to the booth uh, if you want to get all information about the GTEC, uh, if you want to get all information about the National Treasury as well as the Jobs Fund, the booth is there for you. Uh, you can indicate your interest if you want to join there and click follow the instructions and you'd be part of it. The next session will be in the, about 15 minutes from now and the Prof Casey will be joining me on stage and she'll take it over from there. You don't wanna miss that session where we're gonna have live interactions with you as facilitated by our uh, uh, team here in the direction of uh, Prof Casey. So you certainly don't wanna miss that. And from me to you, see you uh, in a short while, in 15 minutes time. <laughs>